Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to go over a couple more reactions. Um, the first one is called halogenation. So this is another addition reaction. So let's draw a halogenation reaction here. So we'll start with an alkene. And remember the alkene can act as a nucleophile because it's electron rich due to that pi bond. And instead of hydrobromic acid adding across the double bond, what if we try to add two halogens across the double bond? So what if we're trying to add bromine across the double bond? How would that work? So you might think that initially the nucleophile will attack one of the bromines. So let's just show that. And then electrons would be left behind on the other bromine. And the reason that works is due to London dispersion forces. Also known as van der Waals forces. So remember, those are the weakest intermolecular forces. And they really only occur instantaneously when electrons happen to shift uh, on one side of the molecule. So if a nucleophile gets close enough to a molecule like Br2, it can kind of push electrons to the opposite side of Br2, and therefore it creates a very small instantaneous dipole across that molecule. And so that's why the nucleophile can attack Br2 even though uh, Br2 is a nonpolar molecule. All right, so normally, given what we've already learned, we would assume that we then create a carbocation. So maybe bromine adds to the right-hand carbon, leaving the left-hand carbon positively charged. And then the other bromine that now has a negative charge could come in and attack that positive charge. However, what chemists discovered is that this reaction produces a very specific product. So that product, I'll just draw it down below, always produces what's called an anti a uh, halogenation product or an anti-addition product. So the bromines always add opposite each other. Now let's go back up to our carbocation. Remember we said before that the bromide, if we do have a carbocation, it could attack from the top or the bottom. So it could attack from up here or from below. But that means we should end up with two products, not just one product, right? However, again, scientists found that only the anti-addition occurs. Okay, so this must not be the correct mechanism. So I'm going to erase this intermediate here because that's not how this reaction occurs. Instead, what chemists proposed is that the nucleophile does attack one of the bromines and electrons are left behind on the other bromine. But at the same time, the partially positive bromine that's being attacked is also going to attack one of the carbons on the double bond. So what we end up forming, which is kind of interesting, is a triangle here with bromine at the top. And then the other substituents are coming off to the side. 
All right, so this is called a bridged intermediate. Um, the other term for this is actually a bromonium ion. So notice that bromine has two bonds here since it's in a um, bridge. So that means it will be positively charged because typically bromine only wants to have one bond. So if it does have two, that would make it positively charged. And uh, you can calculate the formal charge if you would like to confirm that, get a little bit of practice in with formal charges. So again, this is called the bromonium ion. It's kind of a fun name, bromonium. All right, so what happens next? Well, we do have that bromide ion as well, and it's actually going to attack one of these carbons, and they're the same. They both have two methyl groups attached, so it doesn't really matter which one it attacks. Um, we'll talk more about asymmetrical alkenes later. But the bromide ion is going to attack one of those carbons, and it can only attack from underneath, right? Or from the opposite side of the bromine ion up above. So this is actually an SN2 process because we can only perform a backside attack. But when it attacks one of those carbons, that's going to create a Texas carbon, right? So we have to alleviate that strain on carbon, and that means that the bond to the bromine up above will break, and then we end up with our product down below where the bromines are opposite each other. So again, halogenation only produces um, this anti-addition, but we will talk about how to produce um, what's called a syn addition product where the bromines will be on the same side. So we'll talk about that later. But I just wanted to introduce this idea of an anti-addition because um, we are going to talk about another, um, another reaction that involves a bridged ion in the next video. All right, so let's go over an example problem using this mechanism here. So let's say that we have the following alkene. And on one side, we have an ethyl group and a methyl group. On the other side, we have a hydrogen and a methyl. Okay. Now, Let's say we want to add bromine across that double bond. And one thing to keep an eye out for is that the first bromine can actually add to either the top or the bottom. So the nucleophile will come in and attack one of the bromines the shared electrons will be left on the other bromine atom. And then uh, the bromine that's being attacked by the nucleophile is going to come in and attack. Oh, my pen stopped working. It's going to come in and attack one of those carbons. All right, so earlier we drew the bromine above the plane of the alkene, so we had the bridge forming up above, but it could also add from below. So we would actually end up with two intermediates here if we have an asymmetrical alkene. So we don't have the same groups on both sides, so we do have to take that into account in our intermediates. 
All right, and then we'll add in all of the substituents. And I'm actually going to draw them as wedges and dashes um, just to show what's behind the plane, what's in front of the plane. So um, the two substituents at the top, hydrogen and ethyl, will kind of be pushed back here when we form our bridge. And then methyl and methyl will be out in front as wedges. And we can do the same um, for our other intermediate. The methyl groups will be wedges. And then hydrogen and ethyl will be in dashes. So they're going behind the plane. All right. So that means we're going to end up with two different products, right? Because we have two intermediates here. So let's draw what happens when we have a bromide ion coming in to the first intermediate. So um, we'll just show it attacking the carbon on the right. All right. So we end up forming, let's see, so bromine got kicked off to the left here, and the other bromine will be opposite that. And then the ethyl and methyl groups will stay in their wedged and dashed forms. Same for the other carbon, the methyl and the hydrogen will stay in their wedge and dashed forms. All right, now what would happen if we added uh, bromide to our second intermediate here? So again, let's just show it adding to the right carbon to stay consistent. We would end up with uh, bromine getting kicked off down to the left. The other bromine will be up opposite that. And again, we have methyl and ethyl in wedges and dashes. All right. Now, you could have also shown the bromide ion attacking the left side. Um, we would have just ended up with... Uh, uh, slightly different configurations there, but we would have had the same products overall. Okay, so let's figure out what the relationship is between our two products here. So it looks like we do have stereocenters on each of our products. So each of the central carbons there are bonded to four different groups. So let's assign R and S to each of those uh, carbons, and then that will allow us to determine if our products are enantiomers or diastereomers. Um, I know that they're not constitutional isomers because everything is still connected in a similar way. Um, all right. So let's start with this carbon that I'm highlighting in blue. Let's figure out if that has an R or S configuration. So what would have first priority on that carbon? The bromine. All right, what would have second priority? The carbon to the right because that is bonded to a bromine. And then the methyl group would have third priority and hydrogen would have fourth. And hydrogen's in the back, so we don't have to flip our assignment at the end. All right, so if we draw a circle from one to two to three, is that R or S? It's R. Okay. So now let's do the one on the right-hand side. So I'll highlight that in red. 
What has first priority on that carbon? Bromine. What has second priority? The carbon to the left because that is bonded to bromine. All right, and then now we have to decide what has third priority, ethyl or methyl. Ethyl has third priority, methyl has fourth priority. Okay, so the methyl group is in the front. That's our lowest priority group. So we will need to flip our assignment at the end. All right, so if we draw a circle from one to two to three, what does that give us? So I'll try to do that off to the side. So that would be an R configuration, except the lowest priority group is in the front, so it's actually S. Okay, so we have an RS configuration there for our first product. Okay, so now let's look at our second product. So we'll start with the left-hand carbon. So we have the same uh, priorities that we did up above. So that makes it a little easier. So if we draw a circle from one to two to three, what would that give us? An S. All right, so now let's do the other carbon here. We have the same priorities again. And again, the lowest priority group is in the front, so we'll have to flip our assignment. So if we draw a circle from one to two to three, what does that give us? An S. But remember, we have to assign the opposite configuration because the lowest priority group is in the front. So it's actually an R. Okay, so we have an RS molecule and an SR molecule. So are these two products enantiomers or diastereomers? They're enantiomers because all of the stereocenters have changed. Okay, so all stereocenters changed. So this would actually be a racemic mixture because we would form equal amounts of both. All right. And we'll talk more about halogenation in the future. Um, one thing to keep in mind with halogenation, uh, this does work for chlorine and bromine, but it doesn't work for fluorine or iodine. Um, fluorine reacts way too violently uh, to work here, and iodine doesn't react quickly enough. So uh, they're kind of on opposite ends of the scale there, but chlorine and bromine are in the middle and they both can perform this reaction. So just something to keep in mind as we move forward. But again, we'll talk about it uh, in more detail in the future. All right, so let's talk about one more reaction and this is called acid catalyzed hydration. All right, so Acid catalyzed hydration involves an alkene. So I'll just draw a simple alkene here. It involves water. And we'll have some sort of acid that acts as a catalyst. So we could use sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid. Um, but in general, we can just draw a proton in brackets above the arrow to indicate that we have um, a, a catalyst there. All right, 
So this process is going to be very similar to hydrohalogenation. So that uh, first mechanism we talked about where we added hydrogen and a halogen across the double bond. But this time, we're actually going to add a hydrogen and um, OH across the double bond. All right, another point to remember is that the acid is a catalyst, so it reforms in solution. Um, so remember, catalysts are used and then reproduced, and then used again and reproduced. So we never actually use up the acid. Also, we want to make sure water is in excess for this to work. Um, and we'll talk about why on the next slide. Also, watch out for stereoisomers, very similar to hydrohalogenation. So there is the potential to produce stereocenters, which will then produce enantiomers. Now this reaction is also faster uh, with more substituted carbons. And that's because we are going to produce a carbocation intermediate. So the stronger the carbocation, the faster the reaction. All right, so let's actually talk about the mechanism here. There's really only one extra step in acid catalyzed hydration compared to hydrohalogenation. And that step is just the first step. So uh, the water molecule is going to grab onto a proton from the acid. So we'll end up forming the hydronium ion, H3O+, and then the alkene, which is our nucleophile, is going to come in and grab uh, one of those hydrogens from the hydronium ion. Electrons will be left behind on oxygen. And we end up um, forming, again, a carbocation. Now remember, when we talked about hydrohalogenation, we said that uh, the hydrogen would add to the side with more hydrogens. So that's the same thing here. It's going to be a Markovnikov addition. And the reason for that is we form a more stable carbocation. Because if we had added the hydrogen to the other side, we would have ended up with a primary carbocation, which is not stable. So that will not form here. OK, we also formed or reformed water when we lost that extra hydrogen. So now the water molecule can come in and attack that positive carbon and will form the following Now remember we want water to be in excess and this is partly why is this step because the oxygen that's now bonded to the carbon is positively charged and it would prefer to be neutral. So one of the excess water molecules can come in and grab a hydrogen off of oxygen and then electrons will be left behind on oxygen and that's going to give us our final product. which is an alcohol. 
And then notice that we've reproduced an acid. So that is our catalyst that has been reproduced. All right, so again, this is very similar to hydrohalogenation. Um, there's just the additional step of adding a proton to water and then removing it later. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about acid catalyzed hydration because um, the opposite process is an elimination reaction. So we have competing forces here. So for instance, let's say we're starting with an alcohol and this is cyclohexanol. And we saw last quarter that if we add a strong acid like sulfuric acid, um, so I'll write here strong concentrated acid that is a catalyst. And then we add some heat and no water. We'll end up with cyclohexene. So this was the last lab that you did online uh, in 261 but we do end up with water as one of our products as well. So there's very little waste in this uh, reaction. So the opposite process is an addition reaction. So if you add a strong catalytic acid Um, and an excess amount of water. And you run this at cold temperatures. You'll get the addition reaction where you add H2O across the double bond. So this has to do again with those thermodynamics that we talked about um, in a previous lecture. Elimination reactions are favored at higher temperatures and addition reactions are favored at colder temperatures or lower temperatures. All right, but additionally, You'll notice that the elimination reaction um, doesn't have any water involved. You, you want to make sure that there is no water there. Whereas in the addition reaction, you want water to be present in an excess amount. So this has to do with Le Chatelier's principle. So let's say you want to favor cyclohexene. So you want to favor the products. Now, in order to favor the products, we need to add stress on this equation here. We need to figure out a way to encourage the reaction to go towards the products. One way to do that is to actually remove a product um, as the reaction is going because that's going to encourage equilibrium to go towards the products. So if you're removing one of the products, the reaction is just naturally going to want to produce more products. So we can very easily just remove some of the water in the products. and that will encourage more cyclohexene to form. Or another way of saying that is we're encouraging the elimination process. Now, what if we want to favor the addition reaction? So we want to favor the reactants.
what could we do to encourage the formation of cyclohexanol? Add more water, because if we're going in the reverse direction, then cyclohexene and water are the reactants. And if you add more reactants, that's going to encourage the uh, reverse process. Addition, there we go. <laughs> so we're favoring the addition reaction. Okay, so uh, again, uh, in this case, if you want to favor elimination, you can remove water as it forms in the products. If you want to favor uh, the addition reaction, you just add more water. So this kind of goes back to um, Gen Chem discussions on equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle. Um, so, you know, Le Chatelier's principle is actually really, really useful um, in organic chemistry. It's, it's a good one to remember. All right, so I think we'll end the video there. It's starting to get a little long. Um, but in the next video, we will go over another reaction called oxymercuration demercuration. And um, we'll uh, see another bridged intermediate similar to the bromine. All right, so I'll see you then.